Welcome to Coming Home, Survive and Thrive in Homeschooling. Today we have part three in my series of The Schools Are Failing Our Children. I am speaking with Elwyn Poole, who founded and was the head of Mount Hobson Middle School in Auckland for 18 years. Mount Hobson Academy is now an in-person private school for years 11 to 13. Elwyn's knowledge of the state of our modern school system is backed up by the careful and consistent research he undertakes. No matter what you think is or is not happening in the school system, an analysis of facts will enlighten you or alarm you depending on what you think you know. We start with my asking Elwyn how he would define the purpose of education. Unless you have a multi-layered sense of purpose, you won't know when school is failing and what you can do if it's missing the mark, which is the second part of our conversation. For those parents and children who choose to leave the public school system and homeschool rather than enrol in private schools, Elwyn offers another option. I ask him specifically how his resources can assist those who have chosen to homeschool and want an alternative to forming their own curriculum. There is now a nationwide online provision called Mount Hobson Academy Connected for years 1 through to 13. I'm really grateful that you have said yes to being interviewed because I can see from your writings and your research that you know a a lot about what's going on in New Zealand, what has happened in the past, and I suspect you're pretty good at projecting what could the future hold for us. So I'd like to start the interview today by asking you, what do you feel the purpose of education is? And once we've covered that well, I'd like to use then what you've defined as purpose to then go in and answer the questions of, well, what can parents do to achieve that purpose? So so that's the direction we're headed here. So can you please cover, Alwyn, what you believe the purpose of education is? Sure. You, you probably give you a, a really uh, recent and 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 kind of a, a, a tidbit of that. Uh, I was on Leighton Smith's podcast uh, a couple of weeks back, a few weeks back, and he, he was talking about the kind of scandal in New Zealand education at the moment that a lot of our children are graduating without what people call functional literacy or functional numeracy. And I said, "Well, Leighton, I'm not really interested." And children having functional literacy. He, he said, what? And I said, no, I, I don't want them to have functional literacy. I want our children to be literate. I, I want them to have read great books. I want them to have seen and understood remarkable film. I want them to be able to engage in critical conversations and to evaluate what they're being told and, and to have through that I guess common culture and and three of the schools I began or or co-began, you know, all of the kids at year 10 do a couple of Shakespeare's and um, while in Auckland they had the globe, the kids would all go there together from the three schools and they would talk about what they were learning and they would enjoy the experience together and the actors who put on those plays were phenomenal Um, and the experience was quite authentic and yet, you know, they had brought, you know, modernity to it as well. And they always had quirks. And, and I'm pretty sure Shakespeare would have been very proud of it. And so and they, all, they all read To Kill a Mockingbird later in the year. And, you know, the, the conversations that you can have when you've got shared cultural uh, and literate experience is, is phenomenal. 
And, and to me, at the moment, there's a, there's a concern with that. And I'll come back to your original point. But the concern is that I'm not even sure children are watching full movies anymore. Because you can watch TikTok, you can watch uh, YouTube shorts, and, you know, you can get your little flashes of satisfaction from those things and jump from place to place. And it doesn't require much concentration. Um, it's a really lazy way to be entertained. You don't have to follow a plot. Um, you don't have to think critically and, and all those kinds of things. So that's of concern. So to me, the first purpose of education is to enhance someone's humanity. That they would know, I mean, I think history is incredibly important. Uh, I think it's way more important than current events. Um, I've always, um, I, well, I have to say, I have never said to a student, go home and watch the news tonight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't watch it. Um, I think some at first that was kind of a cultural aversion because my parents would watch it avidly and shut up, it's the news. I'm like, what? Yes, that's right. <laughs> So again, you know, to know to know the great books, to you know, to read the Bible, to understand the importance of of that faith and other faiths in the development of history. What even so? One of the projects that our kids do in school was ancient cultures, and they go back and they find out about ancient Rome and ancient China and and, and Greece, and and they go, hang on a sec, these guys were really intelligent. They had these amazing, you know, because otherwise we'd get really arrogant. And tell our generation, I mean, the world was just, you know, it's just rubbish. Well, that's, that's not true at all. You know, we have an amazing world history that children should be aware of. And then people tend to think of aspiration as academic aspiration, and I certainly hold that as a significant part of aspiration. But aspiration is also to travel, to go and see wonderful places. It's also to meet um, really great people. Again, one of the things that we do for our children is to bring into the schools, it's called community learning, just because we needed a name, but to bring into the schools people who are amazing in their fields. One of the people that came in was Dr. Mark Orams, incredible uh, marine biologist, had been on Sir Peter Blake's Round the World Yacht Races, was with Sir Peter Blake in the Amazon, and, and he just presented to our kids in a way that I was just stunned. And, and I said to him as he was leaving, I said, Mark, it's such a privilege to have you in. Why do you do it? And he said, Alwyn, because you ask. And you would be surprised how few people do. And so we have, uh, we used to have a World War II veteran called Wynne Fountain who would come in and present so beautifully to our children, spent six years overseas in World War II, um, lawyers, doctors, builders, the children go out probably for half of their community learning. Um, if it's our homeschool people, then they will organise their own trips and programmes. And so the children never say, when will I use this in the real world? After the first year, for instance, of South Auckland Middle School running, and they are kind of like homeschools except with a school, and they're based on Charlotte Mason's philosophy, which, you know, 120 years ago now, I, I think is still before her time. It's if she was a time traveller. I remember the year sevens, etc. had just done the architecture project and the education review office came in to do kind of a, I think it was a reading us thing. And they sat these kids in the room and they asked them a whole lot of questions. Kids were exceedingly positive, heads up, locked eyes, shaking hands, using their first names because we taught them all this. Not prepped them for hero, just taught them that that's the way to live. And Aaron said to them, well, what are you really enjoying? And they said, we are really enjoying learning about famous things. And so they were learning about the Eiffel Tower, about the Empire State Building, about the Burj Khalifa, you know, as well as remarkable buildings in New Zealand. And, and to me, that's, that's again, so it's a part of enhancing their humanity. And, you know, I'm really big on parents and teachers not pushing down the world's, the adult world's problems on children. We do that in, in all, all manner of ways. You know, you, you have virulent uh, climate change activists who sort of get in and get at these kids. So you'll have an eight-year-old thinking, well, I've only got 10 years to live because they give adults credibility. And so you're filling kids with fear. Now, someone might think, well, it's a good thing that they're aware. Yeah. 
it, what you're doing is is you are laying the groundwork for exceeding cynicism. Because when that child gets to 18, and the world is still a good place to live, and the world is still making progress, you know, you've lost them. So I believe in something, I don't know if other people call it, but I think it, it is positive environmentalism. You know, talk about the benefits of cleaning rivers. Talk about the beautiful benefits of planting kauri trees. I don't know if the sign's still up there, but there was a gorgeous sign at the top of the um, Bongapawa Hill in Coromandel. And, and I think it said something like we have planted, goodness, uh, my recollection is that it was in the millions of kauri trees in this area in the last 20 years. And I thought, that is amazing because the people who are going to benefit from that really are in 100, 200, 300 years' time where they'll be able to walk amongst those giants. And kids do respond to positivity and aspiration that way. And again, I, I love fishing and I've written about the need to you know preserve some of our ecosystem and have many more places in New Zealand that are marine parks and, and free from fishing and protecting snapper during the spawning season uh, and not having bottom trawling in the Auckland Harbour. Those are positive interventions that kids can identify with. To me, that's someone growing up to learn to love people, to learn to care for each other, to be well-read, uh, to be good at their academic work because that creates a future for them. You know, every child in New Zealand should grow up with the upcoming ability to provide for themselves and ultimately a family, a good income, to be able to rent a nice home, to be able to save, to be able to provide for a family when it comes along, um, potentially to buy a house and to fulfil those travel aspirations. And, and I think it's inherently possible. You know, we're stuck in the mud on a lot of educational things. And, and teachers and parents have got a huge role. If I was ever employing someone in a school, my most important question in the interview was, do you love kids? If they couldn't, you know, you know, well, they never got a job. It's just so critical that someone can understand what that word means in that context. And that's their heart. That's a really good, not only just a, a, some neat bullet points of purpose of education, but you've you've rippled out on that so that I think parents listening can get really clear pictures of then if we look for this, then this is what we're headed for, you know, right into a child's future. Yes. Is there anything else you want to pop into the, the, the topic of the purpose of education before we move on to how do we achieve that? I don't think it's a one-sentence answer. Hmm. A lot of parents get in the funk when, you know, the child isn't performing to either their or someone else's expectations. And, you know, the child might be six or seven or eight, and they project forward for the child a massive amount of our most highly successful, creative, purposed, quirky adults were not necessarily thriving at five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, you know, I mean, Mount Hobson Middle School is a school I began way back in 2002, 2003. We had a lot of quirky kids. And so we did those things. We, as much as possible, we, you know, we cared for the kids, we cared for the families. I think over 18 years, probably only five families that didn't like us and one who didn't like us with a passion. And as a teacher, sometimes you've got to accept that and you reflect on it and you, you work out what to do better uh, next time. But the vast, vast majority it worked for. And again, a lot of those kids came in with, say, dyslexia, uh, ADHD, um, on the autism spectrum. Back in the day, it was called Asperger's. And we did a tremendous amount of work on, on how to work with them. Often parents would come in and they'd, they'd be kind of a bit downcast about their child. And I'd say, well, how do you see them? Well, how do you want to see them at 17? Well, what do you mean? And some of them had been told that, you know, NCEA and Cambridge and that, well, it's probably not going to be for your child. 
And I'm like, you can get level one NCA by tripping over and hitting your head. You get, you know, two credits for, for if you can bandage it up. Your child will have remarkable things. We, we need to find out, first of all, what they're interested in. And often there will be a child, particularly on the autism spectrum, who will have a really significant passion. And so it might be, you know, I've had kids, ocean liners is their passion. And, and they'll just, you'll say, tell me about ocean liners and goodness, half an hour later. Um, (laughs) and so they demonstrate that they can learn and they can learn extraordinarily well with depth etc so you're like okay so what we're going to do is we're going to use that interest in the initial part of their schooling and then we're going to slowly broaden it out and we'll apply that same passion in, in other areas if getting through academics is important and i do think it is 97% 97% of those kids over 20 years achieved Level 1 NCEA and moved on from there after they left us. So we didn't do Level 1. They did it in their schools when they went out. They've been remarkable, remarkably successful and moved into the adult world, and some of them are doing extraordinary things because they do see the world slightly differently. So if you can get them, I call that jumping through hoops. If you can get those kids who are a bit quirky through the hoops, that is our Year 11 to 13, you know, whether you're homeschooling or whether they're in school, then they will find their niche in tertiary education. And some of them will find their niche. They'll just go straight into their own business. And sometimes that thrives. I mean, uh, if I'm teaching, I am massively into their mastery of learning. So I will always say you should get consistently 100% in mathematics. Now, oh, 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 maths is hard. No, it isn't. It's actually really doable. There are four, what is it, only two, but there are four operations, add, subtract, divide, multiply. There's then some rules, just like in any game. There's a massive amount of language, and when that comes up, you've got to attack it, and then you've got to put in significant purpose or practice. That's how you become good at anything. But then I explain what I mean by 100% is that if you're set an exercise, you will read the theory before it. It'll be explained to you. You'll do your best with the exercise. When you get stuck, you ask questions. When you get right through it and you think they're all correct, we'll mark it together or you'll mark it. And then instead of just reviewing and correcting the things you've done wrong, you also review the things that you've done right. Otherwise, you won't remember why. And and same, if a child sits a test and let's say they get 62%, then you don't put that test in a drawer. You you go back to it and you go, "Ah, why did I get these ones right? How would I now get these ones correct that I got wrong? And that's the same if someone's learning. I've just started learning piano. Uh, (laughs) I'm tremendously enthusiastic, but I'm at that stage where all my nerves hurt you know, when I'm, when I'm playing. Now, if I'm going to end up being able to play songs, like last night I was, like, it's, it's, it's terribly simple, and I apologise to anyone who's actually a pianist, but uh, there was a, there's a little thing that I'm, that I'm learning that you can go on each of the seven octaves, so you do, I think, the first three with your left hand, the next four with your right hand, and so I don't stop until I've done all seven correctly, and if, I, if I'm two thumbs on a key, I'm, ah, Darn it, so, you know, I'm back again. Well, that's learning and math. That's what you do. You, you don't go, oh, I only got 60%. So if you take a subset of the purpose of education to be academics, both as a parent uh, and as a teacher, you should be gently insisting on the best quality because there's no downside to a student being well-educated academically. So let's jump to parents who are aware their children are still in the public system and they want to change things for the benefit of their child. So they've already made that decision, but they don't know what to do. So for now, I'm just going to, uh, we're not even going to talk today about parents who just aren't interested and they're happy to let it carry on. I'm going to address the parents who do want change. The way I see it, and you tell me if there are other options, there are three options. You can stay in the system and mitigate as best you can. 
but more importantly uh, if we can if we've got time i'd like to hear you address that but more importantly the two that i'd really like to get stuck into today parents want to pull their children out of school what do they do they have two choices they can go to a uh, a private school a faith-based school another option or they can homeschool so can we deal with how you can address first of all those who want to still go to another school so they're still delegating education to uh, teachers and a school can we deal with that one and then we'll move on to how you can help people who choose the homeschooling option Sure. Let me deal with the one you said not to deal with first. Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Thank um, you. Because so so every every September, every August and into September, I do a process, start a process. I get the information from Education Council, which is a very good part of the ministry. And yes, I did just say a very good part of the ministry. Then I process the data for levers for every high school in New Zealand. And for levers is important because that takes in the whole group of people that have come into the school. And what's happened so they can't fudge that data with survivors data you know because some schools it is survivors they lose so many of their students during their journey but really briefly what comes out for me after all of that process is that there are three types of high schools high schools where as a parent you can drop your child off and you're confident they're going to be well looked after they're not going to be exposed to kind of extreme ideology etc etc but as a parent you still want to be involved because you love your kids and, and you want to encourage them and you go along to sports games and things like that. That's being a good parent in that school. Then there are schools that I call can do well schools. And so they've got reasonable results. They clearly can teach and, and organize, but a significant portion of their kids don't do so well. So as a parent in that situation, I'm going to be more involved with my child's learning, probably what you call mitigation. I'm going to be seeing the teachers more often I'm going to make sure I understand the academic uh, qualifications pathways in that school so I can support my child. I'm going to make sure their homework is, is all set up and organised. And then there are schools where you go, goodness, this is the only school in the area. This is the only school my child can get into. We don't really have a choice. What do I do? Because the results of the school are important. And that's when, as a parent, you need to be as involved as possible you know, get in, sit with them every night for homework, talk about aspiration, do all those kinds of things. And they could say things like, well, everyone else in the class mucks around. And you just go, well, hey, you're not everyone else. And, you know, this is how we're going to get you through. There's, there's no excuses here. And some of those aren't, they don't intend to be schools that struggle, but they might be area schools where it's really difficult to get specialised teachers and things like that. So the parent needs to be a more significant part of the child's education. Um, and that's, that's possible and it's feasible. And ultimately, I always say to parents, your child's education is your responsibility, first and foremost. And you've got to make sure it works. And ultimately, you have no right to blame a school. The second one, in terms of seeking a, a schooling alternative, a couple of things to that. So people quite often ask me, uh, well, you know, should I send my child to St. Peter's or St. Paul's? And I'll say, look, their results are pretty sound. If you can afford it, that probably won't be a bad option. I spent four years teaching at St. Cuthbert's College. Um, St. Cuthbert's probably don't want to hear this, but I thought what they were very best at was actually teaching the kids who were struggling. And, and that's not to say that the kids, I mean, I taught a couple of kids there who were best in nation in this subject. And I, I hope I added <laughs> two or three percent, you know, to kind of get them there, but I'm not sure I did. But I know for, for a lot of the kids who, at the beginning of the year, I go, my goodness, that at the end of the year when they got pretty solid results, that would be cool. And, and so that's an option. You know, if you if you can afford it and your child is struggling academically, then that's probably, those options are probably very good ones. I will also say to someone who's thinking of that, and they're at what I'd call a can-do-well school, I would say for $25,000, how much great tutoring do you think you could pay for? How much can you pay for in terms of club sports and things like that? And so sometimes that's also a good option. There are other ways. If really your heart is not to send them to a private school or to boarding school, um, there are other helps available that are really effective. If you decide to go homeschooling, uh, people who think this through, first of all, aware that they have to go through a process with ministry. 
it's more difficult in New Zealand, I think, than it needs to be. And it's become quite a long process because there's a growing demand for it. And, and this is a trend around the world. So in some US districts, nearly 30% of families in the last three years have withdrawn from the state system. It's big. And, and, and not only in the US. And they're, they're homeschooling, but they're also setting up networks and different ways of interacting. Uh, so they're, they're almost, like you'd almost call them natural schools. And I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily being in the forest, so that, that could be a cool part of it. They're schools that have, have formed kind of organically. And there's not a formality that this is a school, but the interactions and the networks are building really beautifully. In the UK, if you want to homeschool, you simply notify their equivalent of our Ministry of Education and you say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm homeschooling. And they tick a box and away you go. In New Zealand, if you choose to homeschool, you get a very nominal help from the government. Uh, I think it's $700 approximately a year. Uh, you can imagine how much those parents are paying in, in taxes. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, there might be something that ACT might want to tackle as a first part of the money follows the student type thing. So if, if someone formally withdraws from the system, then they get what they would have got if the child had gone to school because the ministry have approved their withdrawal, so they've acknowledged that they're capable of doing it. And it would be an interesting political policy for them. Also, if you're homeschooling, you're not invariably harder than people think, but it's often harder than people think. And you're left with a situation where you're thinking, am I teaching them the right stuff? Am I teaching them at the right level? It, it just it just takes, I, I'd say, some thinking through, but a lot of people in that situation would just want some advice. And, and I'm very, very open. It's not difficult to find me on the internet. I'm very open for someone saying, how do I know? How do I know I'm teaching the right level, et cetera? A lot of the time, they're, they're well ahead. Karen and I had our children very young, and we were so naive about things. So I, I think of my oldest son when he was four, and we got him a little bike. And I was actually running quite well at the time, you know, mid-30s for 10K, if anyone knows what that means. And um, I was going for a ride one day, and he said to me, can I come for a ride? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're supposed to be able to do at four. Off we go. And, you know, for years, when I went running, you know, probably until he was seven or eight, nine, ten, when he was running himself, he'd come with me on his bike. And every time he came to a hill, I'd sort of push him up. We did the same with reading. That particular child came out to, well, I was sitting reading to him. I read every night to my kids until they were about 40. Um, we finally fell apart on Wuthering Heights. And when he was, just before he was three, We'd finished a book and I said, go and choose another one. He waddles off. He was reasonably chubby before he went biking with me. And uh, he came back with The Lord of the Rings. And I just went, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Mate. Well, okay, so we agreed that I'd read it to him if he could tell me what happened the day before every day I started reading. He was amazing. Took eight months. How old was he at the time? Before three when he started. Oh, my so goodness. He, I know. And so then, of course, his older brother, his younger brother, a couple of years' time, he wanted it read, so I read it to the both of them. And then the daughter, a couple of years later, she wanted it read, so I read it to all three. So I read Lord of the Rings out loud three times. I didn't think that was abnormal. It, it was just that, I don't know, we were just doing what we did. Now, if you think normality with a child growing up, you will often miss the things that they might be able to do, given chance and interest. And I, I think that's that's always interesting for parents just to kind of stand back a little bit at times. You know, our kids loved Lego. They loved uh, building train tracks and thousand-piece puzzles and all sorts of stuff that people would say to us after a while. That's a bit crazy. So, yeah, if parents are going to choose to homeschool, so one option that I helped establish at the beginning of last year was it's called Mount Hobson Academy Connected. I'm no longer directly involved. It was a deliberate choice to help set it up and then allow people like uh, Sarah Boyle, Maria Namoska, Alison Bronzak, and Catherine Pitt, who were all incredible educators who came out of the state or private system. The full program is well under half the price of a normal private school, and the children have virtual classrooms in the morning. So like Charlotte Mason's program, we head down into stuff in the morning and then it's not so much a play-based afternoon because these kids are a little older 
Um, but the afternoon is different. It's when they do their art, their music, their community learning, their community service, and their physical sport activity. And so that's a full program that they deliver that every parent can be confident that they are getting very high quality. I wrote, I write the project based curriculum for it, but that sits alongside subjects. So their core subjects may think of science, technology, can social I, studies. Can I just confirm that a homeschooling family can register for Mount Hobson yep. and that can be their chosen curriculum? Yeah, so that's their school. They're registered at a school. They don't need to go through the ministry process. Oh, okay. the, the second option that they have is is what we call, a, or what they call the parent lead option, where a parent wants to do the homeschooling, but they're like that parent I mentioned a few minutes ago, and they're not sure. They not don't have the resources. They're not necessarily sure about levels, etc. They can enrol at Mount Hobson Middle School. They can get guidance and oversight, but they organise their day, they organise the teaching, and they have the project-based curriculum and advice on textbooks and things like that. I think that costs somewhere around $2,500. It is money incredibly well spent. If someone doesn't fit in either of those categories, the project-based curriculum is my IP. There are year one to six projects that can be made available, but I have 32 year seven, eight, nine, and 10 projects that are completely cross-curricular, that are things like architecture, uh, great books, everything has got all of the learning areas in, great scientists, ancient cultures, archaeology, chemical reactions. So there are 32 projects that people can be very confident if they use that their children will be doing exceptional work. How do we get hold of you if a parent wants to do that? My email is alwyn, A-L-W-Y-N, dot paul, P-O-O-L-E, at gmail.com. And a thank you to Alwyn for taking the time and so generously giving of his experience to us. You can find Alwyn's articles in Substack and his resources at Innovative Education. Both links will be in the description box. He is also a regular contributor to the BFD, an online media platform. And if you want to contact me, you can find my contact information at cominghomeinfo.com.